You would never refer to them as themselves, but so, the relationship. Last time we were doing those uh, probability teasers. It wasn't just about me having fun with you guys, it was about uh, teaching you certain principles that are going to be important when it comes to all of this. Probability. Yeah. Can we extend some of the homework uh, problem sets back? Just because it's been a yeah. busy. There's like a ton of problems. Sorry. Yeah. Just take more. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll extend a few of them. Just remind me afterwards. Uh, but let's continue. What does it mean like a few of them? Um, we were going to look at the probability of exploring the probability of exploring the probability of exploring the I wanted to just run over a couple of the problems quickly. Uh, the two children problems. So, the thing is, a couple has two children, what is the probability that they have two girls versus the probability if one is a girl and the other is a girl. So it's like they have two girls, but you now have information that one for sure is a girl. versus the probability if, now, the name of the girl didn't actually matter, that was just to throw you off. Uh, the age does though. The older is a girl, then the other is a girl. And I really want to kind of bring your attention to how we actually ended up solving this problem. Uh, we went in a few stages uh, that when we start going into probability in depth, I'm going to be emphasizing these stages, but just so you know, one thing we had to do is we had to somehow find a way to visualize the possibilities. And me introducing uh, sets and tuples to you are going to help us with that situation. We're going to have to figure out how to visualize the possibilities. So. What we visualized them as were, uh, was tuples in this case. So we could say, okay, they could have a girl first and a girl second, or they could have had a girl first and a boy second, or they could have had a boy first and then a girl second, or they could have had a girl first, uh, a boy first and a boy second, right? So there were actually <coughs> four possibilities in this case. And the second thing we had to know is we had to know how to count all possibilities. So in this case, there were four of them. There were four total possibilities. And then what we did was we had to visualize the event we want. And the event we were looking for was that there were two <coughs> girls. So in this, by visualizing all possibilities in this sense, then the possibility that we wanted was this one. And then what we had to do was we had to count the number of our events, or number of possibilities in, within our event. Um, and so in that case, there was only one of those. And basically, uh, the fifth thing we did is the probability is uh, the size of our event divided by the size of the total. Right? So in this case, that was one out of four. Now, we did a similar thing here, but knowing that one was a girl actually changed the possibilities we realized that this situation was it either has to be girl, 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 boy, or boy, girl. The possibility of there being two boys is no longer possible. So uh, when we visualize all possibilities, there are only three things to visualize in this situation. And so uh, knowing that this is the total, and so this is all possibilities in this scenario, and what we want <coughs> 
was just this possibility. And so the probability is going to be how many ways we can get what we want divided by what are all the number of possibilities. Uh, in this situation, uh, now there are only two possibilities, right? Because the older one we know is not a boy. So now that gets taken out. And this is all, all possibilities. <coughs> and then, of course, two girls, that was what we want. And the probability, again, is going to be the number of ways we can have what we want divided by the total number of ways of all possibilities. I'll, I'll be writing down this in, in nicer notation, uh, I think, next class. But I just wanted you to understand uh, what was actually happening. One thing you do know that is needed here is we need to be able to count. And of course, in order to be able to count, we need to be able to visualize what we are counting. Right? So ultimately, that's what uh, the next couple of classes are going to be about, uh, us learning how to count and how to visualize the things that we want to count in the first place. Once we know how to do that, the probability is just dividing one thing by the other. <coughs> okay, so let's just to go over that. I had someone put a question on the video, <coughs> so I just wanted to run over that. What about the Monty Hall problem? Well, it's kind of the same situation, except uh, we can, there are many ways to visualize this. I'm just going to show you one. Um, so here's what we could have done. Here's how you can know that the answer that we got last time is correct. You should switch. Uh, so here's one situation. Let's say that's door one, that's door two, that's door three. There's no situation. That's door one, that's door two, that's door three. I could draw about nine of these, but I, I'm hoping that just me drawing three is going to get it across. And let's put here a switch versus stay. And what we are going to do is we're actually going to count out what could happen. Um, so let's say C location of the car <coughs> and check is door you picked first. How is that situation going to play out? So in the beginning, let's pretend that the car is located <coughs> in door three. Now, knowing that the car is lo located in door three, there are three possibilities. You could have guessed door number one, or you could have guessed door number two, or you could have guessed door number three, right? These are the situations, right? This is what's happening in the background, okay? So the host sets up the, the show, there are three doors, there's a car behind one of the doors. I'm telling you now that the, it's behind door number three. The same argument that I'm saying now would apply whether it was behind door two or one, right? So you can just imagine this argument in a larger context. I could draw out nine of these situations to say, what if it was in two? What if it was in one? But this, this one should illustrate everything. So the car is in door number three. So in one scenario, you pick door number one. In another scenario, you pick door number two. In another scenario, you pick door number three. Now, how would this actually play out in the switch versus stay strategy? Well, in the first situation, if you were to, uh, I picked door number one, Monty. Okay, he's gonna show you door number two. But look here, there's a goat. <coughs> you could have picked a goat. Do you wanna make a switch? If you're like, you know what? I think I'll switch. <coughs> What's gonna happen? You're gonna switch to this guy and you're gonna win the car. You win. If you decide, eh, I feel like you're trying to trick me, Monty, and you stay, you're going to lose, right? In the second scenario, you pick door number two. He's going to say, oh, look behind door number one. There's a goat. I think you have a goat. Do you want to switch? And you can say, you know what? I'm going to switch. What would you do? You would switch to the car because he shows you the goat here. So in that situation, you are going to win. 
And if you stay, you are going to lose. Third situation. You're a bit, you pick the card, door number three. He's going to pick one of these doors at random. It doesn't really matter at this point. Let's say he shows you door number one. Hey, do you want to switch? You know what? I'm going to switch. What you would have done is switch from the card to another goat. And in this situation, you're going to lose. And had you been the person who stayed, you were going to win. Now, how many times do you actually win by switching? Two out of the three times. How many times do you win by staying? One out of the three times. What is better, to switch or to stay? Switching is better. And it's not because of a feeling that you have, or maybe he's trying to trick me. No, the numbers tell us switching is better. You are twice as likely to win. So the probability that you win, uh, given, this is a conditional, I'm going to talk about things like this, that you switch <coughs> is going to be two thirds, while the probability that you win, given that you stay, going to be one-third. You are twice as likely to win if you switch. Right? And this is what probability is about. This is mathematics. The, the mathematics of chance is what probability is. In fact, a game show is a very apt example to do it with because this is actually how probability started. It was about gambling. You know, back of, of, of when mathematicians like Pascal and Fermat were walking around you know, there were just a few pastimes, you know, building empires, getting slaves, and gambling. <laughs> so, yeah. How does this work in the movie 21? There's a blackjack. It's uh, it was 21. 21. Yeah. yeah. I thought they were, they were counting cards there. They were counting cards, yes. How does the Monty Hall come into play there? Oh, the Monty Hall did not uh, come into play there. Just showed it but but it, it, showed, it, it showed him that, hey, this kid knows how to actually think, gotcha. right, about how arrangements. For counting cards, you need to have that kind of visualization, how the cards are going to be displayed, how many are on the table versus how many is in the deck, versus where things are likely to be. It, it's, it gets more complicated. Yeah. 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 I, I, we won't have and No, I'm not going to teach you that on video. <laughs> this guy is teaching these children how to gamble. <laughs> because it, it's, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if it's technically <coughs> illegal, but if you're caught counting cards <coughs> in a casino, you're going to be banned from that casino, and they'll probably rough you up a little bit, depending okay, on the casino. On the so I'm not going to teach you how to count cards. Anyway, but the idea is we have a situation that it was random, it was chance, but by looking at the numbers, by visualizing all possibilities, we kind of know what we should do to make things work out. Right? So. Uh, in a world where not everything is predictable, how do you make a choice that you end up in a better situation in the future? Probability is what has a lot to do with that. And for us, we will be dealing with a situation where we can visualize all possibilities. There will be a finite number of possibilities because there are finite math. There are cases in which there are <coughs> um, But we'll be dealing with the finite possibilities. And based on how it all plays out, what we want to get, uh, we'll know how to make our choices. And if you look at the three prisoners problem, it was almost like the same thing. In fact, mathematically, it was exactly the same thing. <coughs> Remember, you had those three prisoners. They were all on death row. The city decided that, oh, we are going to let one of you live, and we're going to execute the other two. Prisoner A was all worried, went to the warden. Warden, tell me what's going to happen so I can sleep soundly at night, you know? So the warden wouldn't tell him who's going to live because, you know, they could just retaliate and kill the guy or something. Uh, but he's like, you know what, prisoner B is going to die. What that was is like the prisoner who went to the warden to ask about his fate was like the chosen door. He was the guy who was now separated from the other two. He went to the warden and said, what is my fate? And the warden told him, that guy is going to die. What are his chances of surviving now? Is it actually 50-50? Well, the answer is no his chances of surviving is still one-third. There's still a one-third possibility that is behind that door. But it's now two-thirds <coughs> possibility that the other guy is going to be in the car. The other guy has a two-thirds chance of surviving just by him finding out that information. Uh, so, and that, again, coincides with the boy-girl problem, just that the act of knowing more information, finding out more information, can actually change your probability. Me just asking about two girls, 
uh, probability is one fourth. Me telling you one is already a girl, giving you that information, changes the probability. Oh, it's now a third. What if the older one is a girl? I give you more information. Oh, now the probability is a half. The probability will change based on revealed information. So yeah, you might have had a one third chance at the beginning, but once information is revealed, the probabilities actually change. And it turns out it changed in favor of the other prisoner who had nothing to do with anything. So, at the end of the day, those are two things I want you guys to get away from that. Being able to visualize and count something is going to be important, as well as understanding that the more information is revealed, probabilities can change. Which is why, when you go to do something like apply for car insurance, they ask you all this information. Where do you live? What kind of job do you have? What's your salary? What is your social? So that they can check your credit score. The more information they find out about you, the better they can make up a probability table, which is called an expected value table. We'll talk about that. And their, their insurance company is pretty much trying to figure out what are the chances that if I charge them money, they'll end up getting more money from me than I'll get from them. <coughs> Right? And they put this all into a calculation, and they come out with, okay, your premium is going to be 100 bucks a month, or yours is going to be 300 bucks a month. It's all about the likelihood of them actually winning versus losing. They play a game kind of like uh, the Monty Hall problem. Like, what are, what are the chances that I'm going to lose by giving this person an insurance policy? And then they choose all their prices based on that. Uh, so, counting is important. Uh, but can be cumbersome, we need to do it more efficiently. Enter what we call combinatorics. We're not going to do this in any deep way, just a few basics. Combinatorics. This is basically counting <coughs> without counting. Counting in the sense of what people usually think when they think counting, one, two, three, four. Counting here refers to enumerator. And sometimes we will actually use that, right? Enumerator means one, two, three, four. But we're going to want to have ways of counting without actually having to do it one by one. Uh, and we want to do this very uh, efficiently. So we have to study a little bit of combinatorics. And it all starts with, let's look at tuples. Suppose A, B, R sets. are finite sets. They have a finite number of objects in them. Now I want to talk about how many coordinates could I create from this set so that the first coordinate is going to be someone in A and the second coordinate is going to be someone in B. And it turns out that it is going to be the size of A times the size of B. This is called the multiplication rule. And it's a basic uh, way of counting. Uh, it is sometimes extended. Mathematically, it's a way to count tuples. Uh, it is sometimes stated as if an experiment 
as n stages. And n1 equals the number <coughs> of ways, number of outcomes of the first stage. And 2 is equal to the number of outcomes of the second stage, etc. Then, the total number of possibilities of all these numbers, n1 times n2 times n3 times dot 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 <coughs> times n m. So it's called a multiplication. So you can think of it the number of ways you can place certain things in order where each coordinate has is coming from a different set. Uh, you can do that versus just think of it as stages in an experiment, and depending on the context, one might be more convenient to think about than the other. <coughs> Example. <coughs> A equals the set of one and two. B equals the set A, B, C. How many a comma B are there. Where <coughs> X comma Y are there, where X comes from A and the Y comes from B. Now this is straight up a multiplication rule. Because um, here's what counting is as people usually think of it, enumerating. This means you visualize each situation one by one, and you literally just count them, count them off. <coughs> so you could say, okay, well, the possibilities are I could have a one in the first position, because the one comes from the A. Now, Every time I have a 1, for each situation where there's a 1 in the first position, there are three possible situations for the second position. Could be an A, or a B, or a C. So each element in A has three possibilities for what can happen in B, and so that branches off into three situations every time I make a choice for A. Or, there could be a 2 in the first situation, and then there will be three situations for the second you can do one, two, three, four, five, six. You can notice that there are six possibilities. Or, you can realize the size of A <coughs> is two, the size of B is three. The multiplication rule implies that the number of x, y, is 2 times 3, which is going to be 6. So you can just, instead of having to visualize the actual situation, you could use a rule. There's a strategy that works for this kind of situation. Um, it's called a multiplication rule. I have uh, a few more examples where we're going to use the multiplication rule, but I I want to actually move on to another item first. Yeah, for next time I'll, I'll do the next example. Uh, let's look at a different kind of counting strategy. We're going to apply the multiplication rule to a different thing. 
suppose <coughs> A is a set of N elements. <coughs> How many M tuples can we form? Now, m is just a number. It just tells you the number of coordinates in the tuple, right? So basically, I want to create like an a1, an a2, an a3, a m. So I want to choose m things to create coordinates where all these things are coming from this set. And how many possibilities are there uh, with no restrictions? I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you deal with a very important situation where there is a restriction. Okay. So you just said you can just how many total co coordinates you can make? Well, we could do the multiplication rule. <coughs> the multiplication rule implies. Well, you can think of this creating this coordinate as stages of an experiment. The pick in the first coordinate is the first stage, pick in the second coordinate is the second stage, pick in the third coordinate is the third stage, etc. And so <coughs> what we can do is apply the multiplication rule. Uh, there are n possibilities for the first coordinate, but there's no restriction. I can choose any of the n things in the second coordinate as well. And there are n possibilities for second coordinate. And so on, and so forth. So for the third coordinate, etc. So this means the number of ways to actually form an m tuple from a set of n elements is going to be uh, n times n times n times n m times. That is n raised to the m. So if you have a set of <coughs> n things, okay. And you want to pick, uh, create a coordinate of m of them, uh, there's n to the m number of ways. So for example, uh, Phone numbers are, uh, let's suppose, phone numbers are 10 digits long. No restriction. How many possible phone numbers are there? If your phone number is just a string of 10 digits, pretend there's no restriction on the digits that can be chosen, how many possible lists of digits could you create? Now, you don't want to start just randomly picking numbers. OK, one phone number is 111111 10 times. One, 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 one. Right? You don't want to choose a phone number like that. right? Or you don't want to count them, because you'll be counting for a while. Basically, what you do is you visualize. that there are two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's a possibility to put in the first digit, the second digit, the third digit, the fourth digit, the fifth digit, the sixth digit, etc. Right? These are just stages in an experiment. And if I give you no restriction in creating the phone number, there are actually restrictions. But if we're pretending there are no restrictions, uh, we have <coughs> ten possibilities of what to put here. And we have another 10 possibilities of what to put here. And so on and so forth. So the multiplication rule would tell us there are 10 to the 10 possibilities. Right. Now, you wouldn't want to have to count to 10 to the 10. It's a very big number. Like 
10 to the 6 is already a million. And then this is like worse than that. OK, so yeah, I just counted all the possible phone numbers, 10 to the 10, right? And I do that. How did you know that so quick? Did you actually write down a list of all these numbers and actually count them all? No, I use the multiplication. Right? So this is what combinatorics is. Counting without counting. I don't have to actually count the numbers to know how many there are. That's how many numbers there are. Now, of course, if you tell me a restriction, oh, the first digit must be a 1, that changes everything. Right? But uh, without restrictions, you can just apply the multiplication rule. Uh, let's do an important kind of restriction. And we'll see where this is going to come in later. <coughs> no repetition. Okay. So now there are times when we want to talk about possibilities that are similar to this, but we have the restriction of no repetition. Once something is chosen and placed into a location, you cannot choose that thing again. So now, if you have A is a set, and the number of things in A is n, <coughs> how many m tuples can be created in which there are no repetitions. Well, you can apply the multiplication rule here as well. Uh, but of course, you just restrict yourself. So if you have m situations, dot, dot, dot. <coughs> So there are m situations, m coordinates. <coughs> now you're choosing from a set of n elements. How many possibilities do you have in the first stage? So here I'm listing the possibilities. <coughs> so you would have n possibilities in the first situation, right? Because you can choose any n, any one of the elements. How many possibilities for the second coordinate? N minus 1. N minus 1. <coughs> because you have already chosen one of the guys, you cannot choose that guy again. So now you have N minus 1 possibility. For this third, N minus 2. You've already chosen two. You cannot pick those two again. So now you're, you're, you're successively getting smaller. Now once you do that, what do you have when you get to the last coordinate? No, that's what a lot of people think, but that's not true. Yeah. N minus M plus 1. N minus M plus 1. You always have to have the plus 1 because you are including that one. So. <coughs> it's like if you're reading a book and you read and you're reading from page 5 to page 10, then you're actually reading 6 pages because you're counting the 5. Most people think of this original position as zero, and they start counting at the second one, and that's why they get it wrong. Uh, it's actually n minus n. So this means the total number of m tuples without repetition is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 dot 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 times n minus n plus 1. And this is a very important number. We call it P and M. The P stands for permutation. And Why is it called a permutation? Okay. Let's see. 
y permutation. Well, consider the following. Consider the scenario of <coughs> creating n tuples from n objects without repetition. And I'm going to show you why we call it permutation. Now I know this is a bit abstract, but when we start doing uh, some word problem examples, you'll actually see how this is all going to fit together. So you have now <coughs> n coordinates. So you have n times n minus 1 times n minus 2. And the end, we're going to end up with n minus n plus 1, right? So this is if we have n coordinates. So the total number is going to be n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1. This is an important number. We call it a... as n factorial. It's red, not n with an exclamation. It's n factorial. And, and we have p of n comma n is going to be n factorial. Now, what are you actually doing now, notice what you actually did. What this counts is the number of possible arrangements of n objects, right? So I, if I have n objects and I want to put them in order, how many ways could I put them in order? Well, I have to choose someone to be first, then choose someone to be second, then choose someone to be third. Now, once I put the guy in first place, he's in first place. That's his position. I can't pick him again, right? So this is the number of ways to rearrange n objects. And an arrangement is what's called a permutation. The word permutation means rearrangement. Equals rearrangement. So that's why we call this permutation. So there is the idea of the multiplication rule. Applying the multiplication rule in a situation where we have no <coughs> repetition, we end up with something called a permutation. Because it's actually counting the number of ways you can arrange are in this scenario is number of ways to arrange m objects from a set of size n. So if you have a set of size n, how many ways can you pick m things out of that and put them in order? This is the number of ways you can do that. And that is going to be equal to uh, n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 dot 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 uh, n minus m plus 1. Which, by the way, uh, let me just derive the formula that you would actually have in your book for this. We're going to use factorials to rewrite this formula.
So if I have n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 dot 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 down to n minus n plus 1. Now, if that m is not equal to n, what I can do is I can do that little sneaky trick that uh, math people do and multiply and divide by something convenient. What I would continue to do is actually keep counting down n minus m, n, mi n minus m minus 1, and counting all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1, and I divide by that same thing, n minus m, n minus m minus 1, all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1. Now the numerator, if you look at that carefully, becomes n factorial. It's me taking n, multiplying all the integers going down to 1, divided by, me starting with the number n minus 1, and multiplying down all the integers to n minus. So this is n minus n factorial. And so that, that, that is going to be the number, the, the form that you see in your book. P of n comma m <coughs> is equal to n factorial over n minus n factorial. This is called a permutation of m objects from a set of size n. It's the number of ways you can pick m things from n things and put them in a very specific order. This would be the total number of ways you can actually do that. Uh, we'll stop there. I'll give you some concrete examples next time. And we will uh, introduce combinations as well. Thank you.